Right, so in this video I'm going to prove to you these derivatives, these seven specific derivatives of functions, which I stated in the introductory video, but I didn't prove. Okay, so we'll just go through them one by one, and in each case I'll show from the definition why these things are true. Okay, so we'll start with this first one, x to the power n differentiates to n times x to the n minus 1. Now in fact, this is true for any value of n. It can be an integer, it can be a rational number, it can be an irrational number. This is always true. But it's not so easy to prove, so we're going to prove it in stages. So first I'm going to prove it's true for natural numbers, then I'll prove it's true for rational numbers, and finally I'll prove it's true for irrational numbers. Okay, so this first one, although it looks maybe the simplest, will actually take a little bit of time to do. Okay. So that's what we're going to start. So I want to prove that the derivative of x to the n is equal to n times x to the n minus 1 for any value of n, as long as it's not 0. Okay, if it's 0, you get a constant function, which we've already shown has 0 derivative. Okay. Right, so proof. So first of all, I'm going to prove it for natural numbers. This means that n is 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Okay. So in this case, you can just get the result straight from the definition of derivative, which is this. Okay, that's the definition. So if I look at this first term here, x plus delta x to the n. So what kind of term is that? I'll do this in a different color, so kind of an aside. x plus delta x to the power n. This means that you've got x plus delta x times x plus delta x times dot 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 times x plus delta x. Okay, and you have n lots of terms like this. Okay, so when you multiply this out, you'll see that the first thing you can get, if we assume that delta x is a very small thing, then the biggest term coming out of this multiplication is just x times x times x times x n times. So the largest term here is going to be x to the n. The next term is the term where I only multiply by one delta x. So I can do delta x times x times x times x times x and so on. So this gives me x to the n minus 1 times delta x. Okay. But there's some coefficient here because I can choose this delta x here or I can choose this delta x here or I can choose this delta x here. So I have n different choices of the delta x I can choose to multiply by x in this expansion here. So that means that this second term is multiplied by n. n represents the different choices of delta x. I can take this one, or this one, or this one, and so on. Okay. And then you've got the higher order terms, where you take delta x more than once. And these terms, as you will see, do not matter. So I'll just write it something times delta x squared plus something times delta x cubed Okay, and this goes all the way on to the smallest of all the terms, which is where I take delta x everywhere. So it's that. Okay. Now, if I put then, take this and put it into the de definition of the derivative there, then we get that this is equal to the limit delta x goes to 0. So I'll put this expansion into for this term here. So I get x to the n plus n to the x n minus 1 delta x plus something times delta x squared plus and so on plus delta x to the n. So all this expansion minus x to the n divided by delta x. And you see that the x to the n here next to then here cancel and what I've got left all has at least one delta x in so I can cancel the delta x here 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 and so on 
So what I end up with then is the limit delta x goes to 0 of, so the first term I get is n times x to the n minus 1, delta x is cancel, then the next term is something times delta x, and then so on, and this last term is delta x to the n minus 1. But you see that these terms which are still multiplied by delta x will go to 0 as delta x goes to 0. So therefore this term goes to 0, this term goes to 0, this term goes to 0. And that's why I don't care about the coefficients here, because anyway they vanish as I take the limit delta x goes to 0. And all you are left with is the first term here, which is just n times x to the n minus 1, okay? which is what the theorem says not the theorem, it's what I, the result I stated at the beginning. So that completes the proof for the case where n is a natural number, that's a positive integer. Okay. So next I'm going to prove it to you for negative integers, so n equals minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. Okay. Now in this case we've got that x to the minus n, okay. I can write this as x to the n 1 over, okay. Okay. and then I can write this as f of x to the power n, where this function f, f of y, let's say, is just 1 over y. So I can write this as a combination of the function x to the n and the function 1 over y. So therefore, first of all, I can do the chain rule. So I can say that d by dx of x to the minus n, this is from here, and applying the chain rule, this is df by dx, sorry, it's f prime at the point x to the n, multiplied by the derivative of x to the n. And here n is now a positive integer. So this is equal to n times x to the m minus 1 times the derivative of this function f. So to complete this stage of the proof, we just have to work out what is this function f here. Okay. So that's not too difficult. This also follows from the definition. So f prime at y, this is defined as the limit delta y goes to 0 of f of y plus delta y minus f of y over delta y. So what's this? This is the limit delta y goes to 0 of 1 over y plus delta y minus 1 over y divided by delta y. So I can combine the two things on the top together. I can write this as the limit delta y goes to 0, y, y plus delta y, delta y. And on the top then I will have y minus y plus delta y mm -hmm. which is okay and then you see that the y's cancel so this is m minus the limit delta y goes to zero of delta y divided by y y plus delta y delta y delta y is cancelled and then this just gives me y squared so this is minus 1 over y squared okay so therefore in the case that y is equal to x to the n I get the f prime of x to the n is minus 1 over x to the n squared which is minus 1 over x to the 2n okay. so now I've computed this derivative here and I can put this into the formula there 
So I get that d by dx, x to the minus n, is equal to n times x to the m minus 1, times minus 1 over x to the 2n, which is minus n times x to the n minus 1 minus 2n from here, which is minus n times x to the minus n minus 1. Okay. And again, this is the correct result. If I take this formula here and I replace n by minus n, then I get the result here. Okay. So that completes the proof in the case that n is a negative integer. Okay, so next up I'm going to prove it for a general rational number. Okay, so what does a rational number mean? This means that I can write n as p divided by q, where p and q are integers. So the thing I want to compute is d by dx of x to the power p over q. And you see that you can write this as d by dx of x to the power p to the power 1 over q. And again, this is a chain rule, right? I take x, I take it to the power p, I take it to the power 1 over q, so I can write this as d by dx of some function f of x to the p, where f of y is equal to y to the 1 over q. Okay, so therefore, I can use the chain rule here, so I get that this is the derivative of this function f, evaluated at the point x of p, times the derivative of x to the power of p, but we know that p is an integer, which we've already proved the result is this. So, finally, as in the second case, to complete this proof, we need to work out what is the derivative of this function f. Um, which takes y to the power 1 over q. Okay, so again, let me work that out. If I set that a new variable z, which is equal to f of y, which is equal to y to the 1 over q, then this tells you that z to the power q is equal to y. So this tells you that z q is now an integer, so I can differentiate q times z to the q minus 1 is equal to dy by dz. Okay, And then finally, you have to note that dy by dz is nothing but the derivative f prime of y to the minus 1. Okay. So why is this true? It again follows from the, the definition of what a derivative is. If I plot this function then, I've got dy by dz, so I'm considering y as a function of z. So dy by dz, if I take a function which looks a bit like this, it means the gradient here. So I take this point here, okay, and I see the height here is delta y, the length here is delta z, and I define dy by dz is equal to delta y divided by delta z. Now, if I want to consider what is f prime, then I need to consider the function swapped around. So I now put y in this axis and z, which is f of y, in this axis. So you imagine you have to switch the axes, reflect 
in the line here. So that will give me a function which looks something like this. The mirror image of the function I drew previously. Okay, and I choose the same z value here. And again, I take the line here and I look at the gradient there. Okay, so this again here is delta y, this height here is delta z, and you define the derivative f prime of y as delta z divided by delta y. That's the way we define the derivative. And then it immediately follows from these results that this then is equal to delta y by delta z to the minus 1, which is equal to dy by dz to the minus 1. Okay, so this is exactly the result I claimed here. Okay, so as long as you believe that that is true, then I can write that therefore q times c to the q minus 1 is equal to the thing what 1 over f prime of y. So this means that f prime of y is equal to 1 over q times z to the 1 minus q. But what is z? z is just y to the 1 over q. So this is 1 over q times y to the 1 over q times 1 minus q. So in conclusion then, f prime of y, to simplify this, is 1 over q times y to the 1 over q minus 1. Okay. So that's the derivative that I need to put in here. Okay. So now I can take this derivative when y is equal to x to the p, put it in this function and see what I get. Okay. So if we do that now, you get the following. So d by, therefore, d by dx of x to the p over q is from here, f prime of x to the p, so that's this, but when y is equal to x to the p, so this is 1 over q times x to the p to the power 1 over q minus 1, and I have to multiply this by p times x to the p minus 1, so this gives me p over q, and then I have lots of powers of x, from here I get x to the power p over q, minus p, and then here I get plus p minus 1. So this gives me p over q times x to the p over q minus 1. And that's what I want to prove, because remember the result I wanted to prove is that d by dx of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. And if I substitute n equals p over q, then you get this formula here. Okay. So I proved it for the case of a rational, and the final stage is you need to prove it's also true if the power is irrational as well. I mean, you very rarely have to deal with irrational powers in physics anyway, but you know, it's, it's worth completing the proof, I think. Okay. Irrational n. Okay, so here I'm, I'm not going to give a complete proof because... It's a bit messy, and as I said, it's not really necessary for physics, but I'll show you the idea. So what is an irrational number? The irrational numbers are defined as the limit of rational numbers. So for example, if I take n is equal to the square root of 2, okay? This is defined as the limit of this sequence, 1.41421. Okay, I forget it, okay. So you, you define the rash, irrational number square root of 2 as the limit of this decimal expansion as the number of digits goes to infinity. So therefore, I can define
the x to the power of the square root of 2 as the limit of the following sequence. I take x to the power 1.4, and then I take x to the power 1.41, and I take x to the power 1.414, and I take x to the power 1.4142, and so on, just increasing these digits. Then in the limit, as the number of digits goes to infinity, I will get x to the power square root of 2. Okay, that's, that's the definition of a power of an irrational number. Okay. So now I can differentiate these things term by term. If I differentiate this one, then I get 1.4. Remember, this is rational now, right? Because 1.4 is equal to 14 divided by 10, which is of the form p over q. So now I can apply my results. So this is 1.4 times x to the 0.4. Same with this one. This is 141 divided by 100. So this gives me 1.41 times x to the 0 0.41. This one gives me 1.414 times x to the 0 0.414. And hopefully you can see what's happening. The thing you're getting down here, as the limit of the number of digits goes to infinity, the thing you get down here becomes the square root of 2. The thing you get up here becomes the square root of 2 minus 1. And again, that just shows you that the result for rational n generalizes to irrational n as well. Right, so that completes the proof of just the very first result here. So we've done this one now. Okay. So the others will be quicker than this. That took 20 minutes. So the others will be quite a lot faster. So next, I'll do sine and cos together because the proof of both is similar. Okay, so you should know the definitions of the sine and cos functions. The sine and cos functions are defined in terms of the um, angles on a circle. Specifically, if I've got a circle here, then if I suppose that the suppose that this circle has radius one to make things simple, then the length here, if I call this length x, then that is the same as having x radians here for a circle of radius 1, right? Cos x is defined as the value of this point here, okay? So I take the vertical projection down from the point on the circle, and the point I have here is cos x. Sin x is defined as the horizontal projection. So this is sine x. So these are the definitions of the sine and cos functions where x is measured in radians. It's very important that x is measured in radians for this. Okay, so how do you do the derivative? So d by dx, I'll do sine x from the definition. This is the limit delta x goes to zero of sine of x plus delta x minus sine of x divided by delta x. Okay. So what you do is you start at your point x here, then you move a little bit further like this to another point here. Okay, and this, this length here is delta x, the additional length I've moved here. And then again, you take the projection onto the axis here. So this point here is then sine x plus delta x. Now, if delta x becomes very small, then you see what you end up with here is basically a kind of triangle. So I want to enlarge this triangle here. So I'm going to take this triangle point here and draw it bigger. So it looks like the following this, this, and then I've got the curve here, but if delta x is very small, then it's basically a straight line like this. So this is a straight line of length delta x. The height of the triangle here is just this minus that. So the height of the triangle here is sine of x plus delta x minus sine of x. And finally, 
if the angle here is equal to x, then the angle, these are similar triangles, right? So if the angle here is equal to x, then the angle here, no, the angle here is also equal to x. So this is equal to x. Right, so you see that in the definition of the derivative, delta x is the length of the hypotenuse of the triangle here, and the thing on top, sine x plus delta x minus sine x, is the length of this part of the triangle here. Okay? And then it's simple trigonometry to say that therefore delta x is equal to, I should really say approximately equal to, right, because this is not really a completely straight line, it's a curve of a circle, but if delta x is small, it's a good approximation. This is approximately equal to, um, sorry, the length. What do I want to say? No, right to the other end. Sorry, the length here, that's sine of x plus delta x minus sine of x, is approximately equal to the length here which is delta x times the cosine of this angle here. So that's cosine x. Okay, so our kind of geometrical argument, we get this result. And if I take this result and put it into the formula here, you get that therefore, d by dx sine x is the limit. Delta x goes to zero. From here, this is approximately delta x cos x divided by delta x. And you see that delta x is cancelled, so this just gives you cosine x. So that completes the, the proof, kind of geometrical proof. The derivative of sine is cos. Okay, And the argument for cosine is identical, so I won't do it. Similarly... You can show that d by dx of cosine x is equal to minus sine x. Okay, and the argument works in exactly the same way. I take this same circle, but instead of considering the projections into this axis, I consider the projections down onto this axis. So this is cos x plus delta x here. Okay. And applying the same argument, you get this result. Okay, so we have now done the next two on our list. So we've done this and we've done this. So next I've got to prove these two. So these two I'll do together because e to the x and log x are inverse functions of each other. So it's good to do those two together. So d by dx of e to x. So the first thing you need to understand is, well, what is e? And e is just a number, but it's a very special number. And its definition is, is actually related to the definition of the derivative operator. Okay, so before I consider the derivative of e to the x, I'm going to first calculate the derivative of just some number to the x. So here a is some number. It can be 3 or 4 or 4.5 or square root of 2, some kind of um, positive um, real number. Okay. Right, so from the definition, this is the limit delta x goes to 0. You get bored of writing this after a while. Um, a to the x plus delta x minus a to the x divided by delta x. And here you can take out a common factor of a to the x. So this is a to the delta x minus 1 divided by delta x, all times a to the x. But a to the x does not depend upon delta x, so we can take that outside of the limit. So this is a to the x times the limit delta x goes to 0, 
a to the dot to x minus 1 divided by dot to x. Okay, so this thing is the original function a to the x. This thing is some number, okay, because it doesn't depend upon x. doesn't depend upon x, right? It only depends upon a and delta x. For example, suppose that I take the example a equals 2, can you see that? e.g. if a equals 2, then I need to compute that the limit delta x goes to 0, of 2 to the delta x minus 1 divided by delta x. Okay, I bring my phone here because it's got, got a calculator app on it, so I can quickly check what this approximately is. So delta x should be something small. Let's take it to be 10 to the minus 6. So I get 2 to the power 10 to the minus 6. Then I need to minus 1. And I need to divide that by 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so this then gives me the number 0 0.693, so on. Okay, so this isn't exactly the right answer because I need to take delta x goes to 0 and I only took it to be. 10 to the minus 6. If you take smaller values of delta x, you get more accurate answers here. But the point is it converges to some number. Okay, For the case of 2, that converges to the number 0.693. Now, you can ask the question then, is there some number, some special number a, for which this number turns out to be equal to 1? So is there sum a such that the limit delta x goes to 0 of a to the x a to the delta x minus 1 over delta x equals 1. Okay. Does such a number exist? We know the answer isn't 2, but you know maybe there is such a number which satisfies this equation. Well, we can look at it by rearranging this equation. If I just take this here, we get that a to the delta x minus 1 should be approximately equal to delta x when delta x is small. So this means that a to the delta x is approximately equal to 1 plus delta x, which means that a is approximately equal to 1 plus delta x to the 1 over delta x. And if I put back in the limit then, we get that a is equal to the limit delta x goes to 0 of 1 plus delta x to the power 1 over delta x. Okay, and again, this is something you can work out on your calculator then. If I take, again, the case where delta x is a, a millionth, 10 to the minus 6, then I get 1 plus 10 to the minus 6 to the power 10 to the 6. Okay, so this gives me a number. 2.71828 and so on. Okay, and again, this is not completely accurate because I need to take delta x all the way to zero. Um, but those first six digits are accurate. So this is true, and this goes to some number which we call e. And in fact, this is the definition of the number e. It's the number such that this limit is equal to 1. So if this limit is equal to 1, then we see immediately then that d by dx of e to the x is equal to this number, which is 1, times the original function, which is the thing I wanted to prove. Okay. Incidentally, this also shows you how to differentiate any power. Um, sorry, a. So the uh, the differentiate the function a to the x for any number a, all that happens is you get some constant multiplying here, and this constant actually defines the log function. So this is log a. Okay, so this 0.693, whatever, this is log 2. 
and of course log of e is 1, and that gives you this equation here. Right, so that proves the derivative of e to the x. So next I'm going to do log. Okay, so the I've already said how log of x is defined. It's the inverse function of e to the x. So log x is the inverse function of the function e to the x. Okay, what this means is it it does kind of exactly the opposite. So the function e to the x does one thing, and the function log of x is exactly the opposite. So you have the e to the power log x is equal to x, and this is also equal to log of e to the x. Okay. So if I apply both functions, you get back to where you started. Now we can use this fact that log is the inverse of e to the x to compute the derivative of log. So if we set y is equal to log x, then, if I exponentiate this, I get that e to the y is equal to e to the log x. But because it's an inverse function, this just gives me x. Now I can differentiate this equation with respect to x. So I get d by dx e to the y is equal to d by dx of x, which is just equal to 1. Okay. And here I've got a Again, the chain rule, this is e to the y, which is a function of x. So this gives me, you differentiate e, but that doesn't change. So I still get e to the y. And then I need to multiply by dy by dx. And dy by dx is d log x by dx, which is the thing I wanted to find. So this means that dy by dx is 1 over e to the y. But e to the y is equal to x, so this is just 1 over x. So we've therefore shown that d by dx of log x is equal to 1 over x. OK, so it, this method is a general method that works for inverse functions. If I've got a function like e to the x, which I know how to differentiate, then I can also work out how to differentiate the inverse function in this way. I set y is equal to log x, then I use the inverse to write this as x equals e to the y. Then you can differentiate, because you know the derivative of this function using the chain rule, and then finally you can inverse it back here, rewrite it in terms of x, to find the derivative of the inverse function. Okay. So this general method also works for the inverse trigonometric functions. So where's my list? Here it is. I've now proved these results too. Last two, again, I'll do together. These are also inverse functions, right? Arc sine is the inverse of the sine function. Arc tan is the inverse of the tan function. So we can find the derivatives of these functions in exactly the same way as we found the derivative of log using the fact that they are inverse functions. Okay. So I'll start with the arc sine. So again, what is arc sine? This takes a you have to be a little bit careful. If I plot the function set y is equal to arc sine x. Okay. So then I can plot the function of sine of y. Again, it's an inverse function. Function of sine of y looks like this. So arc sine is the inverse function of this function. So if I take a point somewhere here, a value of x, then arc sine of x will tell me the points where this graph meets. Right. So all of these points here 
are values, possible values of the function arc sine x. Okay. However, we want the function to return just one value, not an infinite number of values. So there's an infinite number of different solutions here, but we want arc sine x to just give you one of these values, right? So you make a choice, and the choice which is conventionally made is you consider the function only here. So only between the values of y between pi by 2 and minus pi by 2. So if I take a value of x here, I have many different possible values of arc sine x. By convention, you choose the solution which lies in between pi by 2 and minus pi by 2. In other words, I choose this one. And then you see you get one solution for every possible value of x there. Okay. So what I want to say is that y, which is the arc sine of x, must take values between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2. Right, okay, so this will be significant in a minute, as you'll see. So now that I've said that, we can proceed with the argument in the same way as we did for log of x. Okay. So if I apply sine to both sides, I get that sine of y is equal to sine of arc sine x. But sine and arc sine are inverse functions, so this just gives me x. So then I can differentiate. d by the x of sine y is equal to d by the x of x, which is 1, same as this step here. And then I can use the chain rule here. <coughs> so the derivative of sine is cos, and then I need to multiply by the derivative of y, which is dy by dx. So this is 1. Therefore, I get that dy by dx is 1 over cos y. And the final step is to rewrite cos y in terms of x. So we know that sine y is equal to x. How can we work out what cos y is? Well, we can use the rather handy equation that sine squared y plus cos squared y equals 1. Now, since this is true, this means that x squared plus cos squared y equals 1, which means that cos y is plus or minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. <coughs> but you have to decide which one of these, right? It's either plus or it's minus. How do you decide which one? And this is why it was important to fix the range of arc sine as we did up here in this graph here. If I plot the value, the graph of cos y, then the graph of cos y looks like this, right? And you see that in the values of y for which we are interested in, which is the values between pi by 2 and minus pi by 2, cos of x is positive. Cos of y is positive, sorry. <coughs> so over the values for which the arc sine function is defined, cos is a positive function, and therefore I should choose the plus in the square root here. And therefore, I just substitute that in there, and I get that this is 1 over square root 1 minus x squared, okay? which is the result as stated on my sheet here. Right? Arc sine x differentiates to 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. So that works. But it's important to note that if we had made another choice, for example, if we had chosen the arc sine function to return values in the next segment between pi by 2 and 3 pi by 2, then in this next segment, cos is a negative function. 
So if we had chosen the arcsine function to give me values here, then cos would be negative and I would choose the minus sign here. So it's only because by convention we choose the values to be between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2, that means we know that we should have plus here. Okay, so that's the proof of arcsine. Finally, we have to prove arctan. So the last one. Arctan, arctan x. Okay, so again it's inverse functions, right? So again we should look at what the values are. If I plot y and tan y up here, then you should hopefully know that the tan y function looks something like this. It's periodic like this. And again, if I fix some value of x here, my pencil is run out. If I fix some value of x here, then you will get multiple solutions again. One over here too. So again, we make the convention that we take the solution which lies between pi by 2 and minus pi by 2. So we choose minus pi by 2 less than y less than pi by 2. Right, now, if y is equal to arc tan x, then we take tangent, so tan y is equal to tan of arc tan. So these are inverse functions, so this just gives me x. And again, you differentiate. You'll see this is, again, the same kind of argument as we used in the previous two cases. Okay. So we need to differentiate tan y. So the first thing you need to calculate, which again I'll do as an aside, is d by dy of tan y. Okay, so you may know the answer. If you don't, then you can work it out using the results for sine and cos and the chain and product rules. So if you don't know, I'll leave it as an exercise. The result is it's 1 over cos squared y. So if I put that into here, then I get that therefore 1 over cos squared y times dy by dx, using the chain rule, is equal to 1. So this means that dy by dx is equal to cos squared y. Finally, you want to rewrite cos squared y in terms of x. Well, we know that x is equal to tan y. So we want to have a relationship between tan of y and cos of y. And you can get it from starting from that nice relationship between sine and cos. Sine squared y plus cos squared y equals 1. I want to convert this into a relationship between cos and tan from here, because the tan is what x is, and cos is what I've got here. So I can do that by dividing by cos squared. If I divide by cos squared here, I get tan squared y plus 1 is equal to 1 over cos squared y. So finally, that tells me that cos squared y is 1 over 1 plus tan squared y. Okay, so put that into here. This is cos squared y is 1 over 1 plus tan squared y. But tan of y is equal to x from here, so this is just 1 over 1 plus x squared, okay, which is the result as printed on the sheet here. Okay. So that completes the proof of these seven basic derivatives here. And every other derivative you'll see in this course and in most of the undergraduate physics courses will be based upon combinations of these seven basic results. Okay. So it's a good idea to memorize these results because you will use them again and again.